Hey, welcome to Northview. No matter where you're joining us from, we're glad you're here. My name is Joshua, I'm one of our campus pastors, and some of you might be thinking, well, I don't recognize you. And that's fair, because I'm so new that you probably haven't even seen me yet, so don't feel bad. But we announced two weeks ago that we have plans to plant a brand new campus in central Abbotsford, and we're beyond excited to see what God is gonna do in this community. So if I could make one personal plea, I would just ask you to pray for us, pray with us. Uh, whether or not you live in Abbotsford or even live in central Abbotsford, would you just pray that God would bless our plans, that he would soften hearts, that people would hear the gospel and receive it with joy. If you have any questions or if you are, want to know any of the details, I want to encourage you to go to our website and go to the central Abbotsford location. There's a video of pastors Jeff, Mark, and I talking it all through. For those of you who have young ones around the house, you probably heard all about Marvin the Puppet last week. And I'm here to tell you, Marvin's back. So your kids aren't going to want to miss this week's video. We also want to encourage you to check in on our social media. That's one of the key ways we want to be connecting with you through the week. This week we're starting a brand new sermon series in the book of Esther. And so our team has been hard at work putting together some devotional and study material for you. So if you want to be reading along and studying the book as we do together as a church, uh, I really want to encourage you to do that. It's such a wonderful story. And now I want to hand things over to Frank and his team. They're going to lead us in a few songs of worship. So whether or not you're going to stand to sing or just sit back and listen, let's rejoice in the truth of our God together. God, we come before you, eager to worship you. You are so worthy of our praise and adoration. Would you be made heavy in our lives today? We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. are a tide that's rising and we cannot be contained gathered under one name and oh for a thousand tongues to sing the glories of our Lord God Almighty and oh to sing the Savior's praise the triumph of His grace you are worthy cross where sin was slain, gathered under one name, where every chain is broken and every sorrow swept away, gathered under one name, and oh, for a thousand tongues to sing the glories of our Lord.
Timothy 4, verse 7 to 10. Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. to us from Esther chapter 1. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bible, grab a coffee, maybe a tea, and settle in as we receive the Word of God together. These are Netflix days. Uh, I've come to realize that uh, recently, that there's not a lot to do around. It's lovely when the weather changes and it gets super warm, but when it goes back to what it normally is like here in the spring, 
you kind of feel yourself hanging out inside. There's not a lot to do. Uh, you've already done your jumping jacks and all the other things to get your exercises. So you end up watching Netflix. Uh, my kids have been watching a lot of Netflix recently as well. Uh, they've been revisiting old movies that we have watched uh, years ago. I actually walked in on them the other day and they were watching the Oceans movies. Remember the Oceans movie, Oceans 12 or 11, 12, and 13? If you don't know what those are, they were, um, they were stories about these, these uh, thieves that got together and were going to steal from uh, different very wealthy people, sometimes just for the money and other times to get revenge or whatever it was. Uh, what's, what the mark of those films was, though, that they, um, in the middle, usually you felt like the plan that they had at the front end was totally going into chaos, and you, were wonder, you wonder halfway through, there's no way that these guys are actually going to be able to pull this off. It looks like the people who are trying to catch them or stop them are way ahead of them. But at the end, you realize that all the threads that it looked so loose in the middle all come together in this one fantastic hole. It leaves you with this remarkable smile on your face, thinking, oh my goodness, uh, what, a, what a story. What, what a director to bring all of these things, all of these things together. And so my kids really enjoyed watching those, and we smile and laugh at how wonderfully made they are. And they say, that director, Steven Soderbergh, he's amazing that he, that he was so good at, at doing this. This story that we're going to be spending the next few weeks on is like that. Uh, the book of Esther is perhaps one of the best stories in, in the history of the world. It is filled with intrigue. It is filled with uh, cheating and weird things like uh, beauty pageants and uh, kings uh, getting drunk and making uh, their wives uh, dance in front of other men or thinking they can. It's, I mean, you could really turn this into a movie these days and have it... Uh, have a go well. I'm sure people have. Um, but in the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time looking at the book of Esther. And in it, what you're going to find is that uh, this story is the kind of story that at the end you say, wow, what a, what a story. And, and what a director who organized it. Um, you'll end up giving praise to God for how great he was in saving his people from uh, what really was a holocaust. And so we want to look at it over the next number of weeks. It's going to take several of them. The book is about 10 chapters long, and so we want to spend some time uh, in each chapter, actually. So each week, we'll kind of take one chapter at a time. This week, we're going to look at Esther chapter 1, get the story started. What I want to do is I want to first tell the story, and then after I tell the story, I, I want to give you three lessons that we're going to learn about pride in this passage. This story is about a, a prideful king, and we're going to learn some lessons about the pride that he, he shows and then ultimately see how it is that, that, that Jesus delivers us from that, that kind of pride, okay? So first, let's look at the story itself. Here's how it goes. Verse 1 of Esther chapter 1 says, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Cush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. And for a full 180 days, six months, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. And when th these days were over, the king gave a banquet. And the banquet lasted seven days. And in the enclosed garden of the king's palace, for all the people, from the least to the greatest, who were in the citadel of Susa, they all came. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to search each man that, what he wished. And Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. There's a lot, there's a lot here. I need to give you a little bit of background uh, and then give you a, a feeling for what's going on here, what scene is being set for us. Um, the first thing you need to know is that this uh, story finds its placement in the history of Israel during the time where 
the people of Israel have been conquered by the Babylonians. You might remember that. Guys like Daniel and others were taken from, uh, from Jerusalem and pulled then to Babylon, the main city of the Babylonians. And then several years later, uh, the Persians come in and they conquer Babylon. So Babylon conquers Israel, then the Persians ba conquer Babylon, and, this, and the main city moves to this place called Susa. So this would be very much like if uh, Washington State conquered British Columbia and a bunch of people ended up moving from British Columbia or being taken as hostages to Seattle. They got used to living there for a while and then California came up and conquered Washington and then everyone ends up moving down to Los Angeles. And that's what happened. Lots and lots of Jewish people who moved to Babylon from Jerusalem ended up moving to Susa. And so they have this large Jewish population there, and that's really what happens in, in this story. What, what's going on with this Jewish population, which is very much a minority in that, in that area? Susa was a beautiful city. It was where the king's, king had a winter palace, and the palace was amazing. Most of these palaces had attached to them these, these gardens. And uh, the gardens, when you and I think about that, uh, are different than the gardens that they had there. The gardens that you and I think about are we go to someone's house and we say, oh, what a lovely, what a lovely garden you have. And we think, you know, it's, it's, you know, you could walk around it in, I don't know, 10 seconds or whatever. It's got a few flowers in it and they, maybe they've taken care of it a lot. But the gardens in, in Persia, in fact, the Persians were known for their gardens. They used to call them in Greek, well, when the Greeks ended up describing them in later times, they, the Greeks called it the paradesos. And that should sound familiar to us English speakers because it sounds like paradise. And that's what they were. They, they were paradises. They were enormous, these gardens. You would, have, um, you would have people able to hunt in them. People could come and take vacations in them. They used to say that they had a plant of every variety around the world in the Persian gardens. They were known. So maybe, I don't know, butch art gardens or something like that. That's kind of what this is like. Huge, huge gardens where lots and lots of people can gather with wide open spaces and they can have big, big parties, which is exactly what they do. They have a, a 180 days celebrating King Xerxes. And in that 180 days, he takes tours with all the important people in, in the area. And uh, he shows them all the wealth of his kingdom. You know, this one city in this location in Persia has, has a huge sculpture that you need to see. And it's there because I commissioned as, it, it as a work of art. And this other one has architecture that you need to see. So what you, what you have is a six-month parade around the area with all the important people seeing all the sites to try to remind all of these nobles and important people how valuable and wealthy and amazing is King Xerxes. And at the end of the 180 days, they throw this party that happens in this garden. And the party lasts a week. The garden is enormous, it's beautiful, and the party is meant to display the king's wealth. You probably kind of f f lost interest when there were all sorts of um, things being described there, right, in the middle of this in the middle of this passage where he talks about uh, the, the different uh, things that were hanging off of hooks or, or what kind of goblets they were using. They were made of gold or what kind of couches they had, silver and gold couches. But the reason that that's listed there is so that we, the readers, can say this, this is the best party that there has ever been. It's the most expensive, most ornate, most elaborate party that has ever existed, perhaps in the history up to that time. Xerxes is trying to show everyone how wealthy he is, how remarkable he is. And the most important detail for us to note is that the bar is open. I mean, seven straight days of drinking. And so you can imagine, after seven days of drinking, uh, you might get quite sauced. And that's precisely what happened. So on the seventh day, verse 10... When King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abektha, Zethar, and Carcass. These are lovely names for you to name your children if you're looking for some, you new mothers. Carcass. This is my son, Carcass. Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abektha, Zethar, and Carcass. These are the names of the eunuchs, the servants of the queen, servants of the king, to bring before him, Xerxes wanted him, them to bring before him Queen Vashti, 
wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Well, uh, something that many people don't know, you'll find this interesting. Uh, The Persians believed that the best decisions one could make were made when you were drunk. In fact, they thought that if you sobered up and made a decision while sober, you really couldn't trust it. Because when you're sober, other factors kind of come into your thinking. You know, the politics of a thing, or the PR of it, or the optics, or whatever. There are other factors that that you think about when you're sober. But when you're drunk, you do what is straight out of your passion to do. And so the best decisions, the ones that are truest to the heart of the king, the truest to the impulse of the king, were ones that you made when you're drunk. So it's not uncommon for a king, for example, to be at a party like this, where he's shown up all his wealth, tried to impress everyone with the different kinds of goblets that they're drinking from. It says, in fact, that they were all of a different variety. Silver couches, marble, porphyry everywhere, mother of pearl. And he kind of runs out of things to wow people after the seven days. You know, if you go to the same place seven days in a row, it doesn't matter how nice it is. The first day of the seventh day, you're kind of like, huh, it's just kind of normal now. They've been drinking for seven straight days. He realizes that he doesn't have anything to wow them anymore. And so he gets a great idea, a great drunk idea. I know it will wow them, my lady. Vashti is the most beautiful woman around. She's lovely to look at, as it says in the passage. If I can get Vashti, my, my lady, to come out here, put a royal crown on, do a little twirl for, the, for all these men at this party, they will realize that not only do I have all the things in the world, like gold and silver and architecture and cities and sculptures and all, not only do I have all of that, I also have another thing that I like to show off. Hey, eunuchs, go get me Vashti. Bring her here. You can imagine these guys going down the hallway to the other party. There's another party going on where Vashti is celebrating with the women. And you can imagine the eunuchs come in and say, hey, the king wants you to come. And you can even imagine all the women standing there around thinking, the king wants you to come and kind of do a little twirl. He wants you to do a little you know, beauty pageant for all the guys so they can ogle at you. And Vashti, probably looking around to all these other women and thinking how ridiculous a request this is, because in those days, that's the kind of thing you would command a concubine to do. That you had a wife and then you had concubines. The concubines were the ones that you brought out to show off to the men. You you don't treat your wife like the concubine. And that's what Xerxes is requesting from Vashti. And Vashti, of course, says, no, in good self-respect, She stands her ground. I'm not going to come out there, act like a concubine in front of your friends. Are you drunk? Well, yeah, he is. She refuses. Eunuchs run off down the hall. They come into Xerxes, who's excitedly waiting, probably wondering, okay, is the queen coming in after you guys? And nope, it's just them. One of the eunuchs says she's not coming. What? How dare she? Of course, all these guys are looking at this point. Do you have control over your wife? They're probably thinking. Xerxes can feel it, so he burns with anger. Well, verse 13, since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times. These guys will know what to do. And they were closest to the king. Their names were Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memukin. The seven nobles of Persia and Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom, right? These are his trusted advisors, the mucky mucks, the senior team. And he gathers them together. They're going to make a decision about what to do here. According, verse 15, to the, law, to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, asks 
asked Xerxes. She's not obeying the command of King Xerxes and the, that the eunuchs have taken to her. So what does the law require? I should have to punish her, yes? In fact, that's probably, King wants to punish her, but wants to do something according to the law. Verse 16, Memucan replied, in the presence of the king and of the other nobles, he said, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women so that they'll despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she wouldn't come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct, they were probably at the party with her, will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. And then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Isn't this great? They gather together. You gotta picture the gathering of these minds. They sit together. What shall be done with this disgrace from Vashti? Not only did she do it, she did it in public before other women who are probably the wives of the men in the party in the other room with Xerxes. She was given a command from her husband, her king, and she didn't obey it. What kind of example is that setting? So Memucan, he comes forward in this meeting and he makes this argument. You got, there's two issues here, Xerxes. Number one, the, you can't let somebody just disobey the order of the king. If that happens, everyone's gonna disobey the order of the king. Like you will lose power and prestige. You've been trying to point out your prestige and wealth and power all these 180 days. And now you're gonna give that all away because your wife says no to you? A king is bigger than that. But second, this isn't just about you as king, this is about you as husband and it's about us as husbands. Like what's gonna happen here? Like later on when we go home and my wife was at the party with Vashti and I was at this party and we go back home and I say to her, honey, get, get the dinner on the table. And she says, uh-uh. And I say, yes, you will do it. And she'll say, well, Queen Vashti doesn't have to do that kind of thing for the king. I need my dinner. So much is at stake, Xerxes, says Memekin. You, you need to draw a line in the sand. We need to make issue a decree that cannot be ch ch changed so that you punish her, kick her out, replace her with somebody better so that every woman in this entire area knows not to mess with us boys. Know that when they say no to getting dinner on the table, I can say in response, do you want me to kick you out? Well, the king and his nobles, verse 21, were pleased with this advice. Of course they were. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no women making this decision. It's a bunch of guys. The king and his nobles were pleased with this. So, yes, this is, a good, this is a good piece of advice. Let's make sure that the women do what we want. So the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler of his own household using his native tongue. You can see all the language in there talking about it. He gave it to everyone in their native language using their native tongue, to everyone from least to greatest. The point is that he made sure that every single person in his kingdom understood what was going to happen to Vashti so that there would be a rule established. There'd be a rule established in the land. Well, that's the end of chapter one. Uh, it does set the stage and it, it is intriguing as it goes on, but I wanna stop here and I actually just wanna reflect a little bit on Xerxes. 
and Vashti and the story and how it is that uh, they did this thing. And ultimately, what can we learn about pride here? Because that's really the issue, isn't it? I and mean, this, this is a prideful man. What can we learn from this prideful man and how he responds? And ultimately, what's going on in this story, to, story altogether? So uh, three lessons about pride. Here's the first one. There's a problem with pride. There's a problem with pride. You know that. I don't need to explain it to you. But you can see it in the passage that Xerxes is a proud man boasting in his wealth. He gives people this grand tour of his kingdom. He throws them in this party where he's, you know, like, this party is dripping, man. It's got everything in it. It's amazing, this party. People are wowed. That's the whole goal of it. It's like an Academy Award party with all the prettiest people there, and it's at Brad Pitt's house, and everyone's amazed at the whole thing. He's trying to wow them. He's trying to boast in his greatness. It's the whole point. It's why he ends up asking Vashti to come in. Not only am I great, not only do I have great other things, look at this one thing I have that is even greater. She's a babe. Do a twirl for us, honey. Pride, pride, pride. Boasting, boasting, boasting. And you see in the story that this sinful pride really does get this guy in trouble. I mean, he's drunk at the time and he tells her to come out and, and she ends up saying no. And now he's going to lose face. His pride is going to be killed off if he, doesn't, if he doesn't teach her a lesson. This is the, what happens. Pride and boasting is not just his problem, it's our problem too. And it usually causes a lot of our troubles. And our pride and boasting take many forms. Sometimes it's as outlandish as this. Sometimes we, we boast and try to point out our greatnesses. You probably know friends like that who, whenever you're with them, tell you how fantastic they are at whatever it is that they think they're fantastic are. At, excuse me. You probably uh, know people who, at every turn, try to show you their car or try to show you their house or try to tell you about the exploits of their child, whatever. That's kind of what he's doing here. But, but there are other forms that pride takes. Um, one of them in Scripture is what's called presumptuous planning. This might be a surprise to us. James chapter 4, I, I quote this passage a lot, has a lot of meaning right now, as you'll probably see. James chapter 4, verse 13 says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So you don't even know if you're going to live tomorrow. So when you make your plans, don't be presumptuous about them because everything's dependent upon the sovereign pleasure of God, whether or not he allows it to take place, whether or not he gives you breath tomorrow. Most of us before COVID-19 had lots of plans, and now we don't. Now we watch Netflix. Why? Well, because it's the Lord's will for that sort of thing to happen at this point. And we should have made our plans with a recognition that that was the case. But at the end of this passage, James says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. See, the problem is that you think you're in control of the world. You think you can make plans and have them come to fruition because you're capable of making them happen. You boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is, is evil. It's a story I came across this week, actually. It illustrates this really well. It uh, was about this, uh, this guy from Oklahoma. He had come to, to Chicago on a bus. He was a farm boy and come to Chicago on a bus to become a boxer. He eventually did become quite a famous boxer in Chicago. It was in the 1950s. When he got off the bus, he had a couple of suitcases under his arms, all of his worldly possessions, and he set them down on the street just in front of the Sears Towers, 110 stories or whatever it is, being one of the biggest uh, buildings in the world. He stood there and looked straight up at the Sears Tower, but instead of being in awe at it, he said, I'm going to conquer this city. And then when he looked down, his suitcases were gone. Right. <laughs> like our, our, that's the way our plans are. Sometimes we say, well, I'm, I'm going to do this. And then we realize, oh, that's right. I don't even have the power to control whether or not a thief is stealing them when I'm looking up. Right. So one way that 
pride shows up is that we make presumptuous plans and we assume that we can actually bring them all to fruition. Another way it shows up, quite honestly, probably more commonly, is it shows up in our comparisons with each other. There's a salesman uh, that uh, I met years and years ago who said to me that when he went into a, went, went into a house and he, sold, he, he did some door-to-door sales for some stuff and went to a house, one of the best ways he could get people to to, to, to close, one of the best ways he could close the deal was when he would say, let me show you something your neighbor said you couldn't afford. Like it was just a way for him to say, you know, I, I understand that it costs a lot of stuff. And yeah, I, I, when I came, before I came here, your neighbors all said that you probably would respond by, you know, balking at the price because they said you probably couldn't afford it. I mean, they bought it, but that's the way we function though, right? I mean, we, we don't want to be less than the, than the neighbor, why, why do we buy the stuff that we, that we buy? I mean, a lot of times, oh, we like it, but why do we like it? Well, we like it because that other person has it. And I don't wanna look stupid. Why do we keep up with the styles that we keep up with? Well, I don't look dumb. Why do we upgrade our houses all the time? Well, I don't want it to be out of style. Well, why not? Well, because I, I don't wanna be worse than them. Why don't we celebrate the gifts and abilities of others, right? If somebody else does something really well, they win the highest award, but you get second place, what's your response? Yay for you. No, it's never yay for you. It's like, ah, can't stand them. They only won because the referees are their cousins. They only won because I had a hurt leg. They only won because I, sh- I should have won had uh, the, the calls gone my way. I should have won had it been on a Tuesday instead of a Monday. There's always some reason, right? Why is it that we can't just give credit to those, to those other people? It's because we feel less in comparison to them when they get gold and we get silver. C.S. Lewis actually used to, in his little book, Mere Christianity, which is a lovely little book, uh, he said, pride gets no pleasure in having something only out of having more of it than the next person. Pride gets no pleasure in having something only out of having more of it than the next person. And that's right, right? Pride feasts on the idea that it's not that I'm rich, I'm just richer than you. It's not that I'm pretty, I'm just prettier than you. It's not that I'm smart, I'm just smarter than you. If everyone were equally smart, equally pretty, and equally rich, there would nothing to be nothing to take pride in. So pride flourishes in a world of comparisons. To us, wealth, beauty, intelligence, those are all signs of, ex- of success. And so we chase them because we don't want to look like losers in, in comparison. And of course, it leads us into horrible situations, this chase. It kills our relationships, this chase. I mean, you don't want to spend time with people who are always talking about the exploits of their, their kids to the exclusion of yours. You get tired of seeing the car. Yes, I get it, it's nicer than mine. You get tired of it. Leads us into a lot of relational challenges. Also though, pride shows up a lot in our arguments. It's not just presumptuous planning or comparisons, it really does show up in our our arguments. There's a story I read this week of uh, these two ships in 1986 on the Black Sea, two Russian ships, and they crashed into each other and actually uh, Hundreds upon hundreds of people die, died. They drowned in the cold, icy seas. And uh, after the fact, they, they tried to figure out what happened. And uh, because the ships saw each other, it wasn't a horrible night. It wasn't dark, cold, or anything. They just rammed straight into each other. Apparently, one of the captains signaled the long way off to, to, that he had the right of way. The other captain said, no, you don't. I have the right of way. And the first captain said, no, I have the right of way. No, I have the right of way. No, I'm Captain So. No, I'm Admiral So and So. And by the time they were done fighting, they were also at the bottom of the ocean. Didn't want to back down. That's the way our arguments work, isn't it? I mean, that's why we end up crashing and burning in our relationships, and we we sink them, isn't it? I mean, if you, you pulled an, if you pulled an argument apart and you just wanted to look at the anatomy of it, how does it how does it work? Well, somebody does something to another person, right? They, they, they don't take out the trash. I mean, I know we, we never argue about those sorts of things. Our, our arguments are always more important. Let's just for the sake of argument, look, we, we don't take out the trash, even though we were asked to take out the trash. And the person who asked to, the other to take out the trash says, you don't respect me. 
Here I am doing all this work and I've asked you to do this one simple thing, take out the trash. You don't respect, do you not know who I am? Hey, you need to take out the trash, they say. And then the person who's been asked to take out the trash says, don't you know who I am? It's not like I've been just sitting here doing nothing. It might look that way, but I've been doing lots of important things, trying to figure all sorts of other stuff out. Don't you respect me and the work that I do here? And the other person then who asks them to take out the trash starts thinking, oh, it's gonna be like that, is it? And then the other person says, yes, it's gonna be like that. And back and forth and back and forth we go. And then one of them drives away angry and the other person goes in their room crying. I've never experienced this, but I've been told it happens. That's how arguments happen in marriages. That's how they happen among coworkers. Nations suffer due to pride. Marriages suffer due to pride. Workplaces suffer due to pride. We suffer due to our pride. So yeah, uh, there's a problem with sinful pride. We can see ourselves sometimes in Xerxes if we look closely. But here's the second thing we learn in this story, that there's a providence, though, over sinful pride. You would think that because we are sinning when we're prideful like this, that we're basically ruining God's plans. Because what God needs is for everything to be done right in order for his will to ultimately be done. But what you find in this chapter and ultimately in the whole story of Esther is that's not the case. In fact, in this story, had Xerxes not been so arrogant that he wanted to celebrate this big party for a week long and show everything off and have an open bar to show his liberality and he gets drunk, had that not happened, he would not have made this obscene request to have his wife come over she would not have rejected it in righteousness. He would then not have to respond by kicking her out of her position. And by kicking her out of her position, the door is swinging open for another queen to come in and take that place. And her name is Esther. So had none of this happened, had none of this happened, what God had planned ultimately was to save his people from tyranny it would never have taken place. So what you see is that even though, even though we sin, God's plans are not destroyed by those sins. Even though we're prideful, God's plans are not destroyed by our pride. In fact, his providence, his sovereignty is so all-encompassing that it even includes our failures to work things out. It's like that Oceans 11, 12, 13. It looks like chaos in the middle and everything's going wrong, but at the end, God is working everything out together for the good of his people and the good of God's glory. It's quite remarkable and beautiful. In fact, when you look in the book of Esther, one of the things that you'll find is the name of God doesn't show up ever. Isn't that amazing? Now you and I, we don't think that's a big deal because most of our movies happen in an atheistic uh, universe. I mean that, that when, when we make movies, we very rarely, the characters are very rarely praying, they very rarely talk about God, they very rarely talk about anything having to do with deity. In the ancient world, it was the opposite. You never told a story without people praying, uh, without people uh, relating to a deity on some level or another. You never did that. So when you have a story, an ancient story like this that looks more like you know, atheistic, secular, modern tones and not like the way it was done in the time it was written, you kind of have to take note and think, why in the world is this such a secular book? What is it, what, in secular meaning, absent from religious mention? And the answer is that's deliberate. Because that's the way it looks from our point of view, isn't it? I mean, people, kings and queens and, and friends and people outside of our control make decisions that influence us and it feels like we are just the objects of their will and decision making and there's nothing that can be done. It looks like chaos. There's no God anywhere to be found. And yet, there actually is a God. And he is quietly working through all of those decisions and bringing about his perfect ends. Regardless of how sinful the decisions are, he's bringing about his perfect ends. I take great solace in this because I don't know about you, I read a lot online these days and it seems like there is a debate starting to form between uh, 
the, the COVID bros and the COVID idiots. Uh, the COVID bros are the people who are like, stay home, we should never come out. And anyone, any leader who says we should come out of our houses is crazy. And then who are called the COVID idiots, they're the ones who say, no, we need to open up. We need to go back to normal. This is crazy. It's not an emergency. Back and forth, they go, fight, 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 fight. And the fight is over whether or not the decisions being made by our leaders are the right decisions or whether or not they're driven by their own selfish pride, by their own desire to be in, in, in office, or whatever. And both sides have good arguments to make, but what's lovely for people like you and me who know the Lord Jesus and know his sovereignty and providence, what's lovely for you and me is that we can look at all the decisions being made and we can say, yes, some of them are going to be evil, some of them are going to be good, but God is going to work in all of them for the good of his people, and the glory of his name. So we can let it go in some cases. Yes, we can claim it's wrong and say it's wrong and fight back if we need to, but we can know God's on his throne. Even though you can't see his name's not mentioned, oh, he, he's working quietly in all of it. So I said that there were three lessons we're going to learn now. The problem of sinful pride, the providence over sinful pride, and then finally the, the power over sinful pride. Have you ever wondered how it is that you and I can get free of the pride that destroys our lives? I mean, it's true. Xerxes, his story is, you know, it's, it's an extreme case of how pride ends up screwing up his life. But, like, pride has screwed up our lives and our relationships. It doesn't take very long for you to look back at your own life and realize, oh, my goodness, it's been... It's been my pride that's caused a lot of difficulty. How, how do we get free from that? How do we, how do we live lives that are prideless? There is a wonderful book that I, exp I, I want you to read. It is called The, the Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. It's written by Tim Keller. It is really small. You, you can read it on Kindle. You can get it on, on, online, okay? You can just read it on a digital device or you can order one. It'll be at your house soon. It's a very short read called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. In this book, Tim Keller argues this. He says that we tend in our society to oscillate between um, the opinion that people are, are uh, the pro the, what they need, somebody who thinks really highly of themselves like Xerxes, what he needs to do is not think as highly as himself. That's kind of the traditional view. When you were a little, when I was a little kid, if you were kind of arrogant, people would say, stop that. You're not as good as you think, okay? And for centuries, that's been the way people dealt with it. If you find somebody who's really arrogant or you find somebody who's really treating, mistreating people, their, their problem is they think too highly of themselves. They need to be brought down a few notches. There are cultures around the world where that's called the tall poppy syndrome. You just chop them off. The more modern approach, though, to that problem of somebody misbehaving and acting very poorly is to say the reason that they are doing that is not actually because they think too highly of themselves. It's that they think too lowly of themselves. And so what we need to do is need to pump their tires a bit. We need to give them some self-esteem. So the whole self-esteem movement since the 1970s and 80s is really built into this, right? We make jokes about millennials being, you know, snowflakes or whatever, whether they are or aren't. But... We make jokes about that because they've, everyone got a trophy and everyone gets a ribbon and every, every moment is safe for them. And that's because they grew up in a world where self-esteem was being pushed on them. That's the more modern approach. So the problem with people in the modern approach is that you think too lowly of yourself. The problem with people in the old approach, the traditional approach, is that they thought too highly of themselves. So we oscillate. We go between the two. We give advice either one way or the other, depending on what perspective we come to. Tim Keller writes this about that approach. He said, wouldn't you want to be a person who does not need honor, nor is afraid of it? Someone who doesn't lust for recognition, nor on the other hand is frightened to death by it? Don't you want to be the kind of person who, when they see themselves in a mirror or reflected in a shop window, they don't admire what they see, but they don't cringe either? Wouldn't you like to be the type of person who, in their imaginary life, doesn't sit around fantasizing about hitting self-esteem home runs, daydreaming about successes that gives them the edge over others? Or perhaps you tend to beat yourself up and to be tormented by regrets. Would you like to be free of them? Wouldn't you like to be the skater who wins the silver 
and yet is thrilled about those three triple jumps that the gold medal winner did. He says, this can be had not by thinking more of myself as in modern cultures or less of myself as in traditional cultures, but simply thinking of myself less. See, it's, it's not, he's trying to say, look, the solution to the problem is not self-esteem and it's also not self-hatred, it's self-forgetfulness. So how do you get self-forgetfulness? Well, he goes into talking a little bit about how all of us are basically in a courtroom in our lives. We feel like we are on trial. We are being judged by all those around us. And some days we feel like we're winning the court trial, right? Because we're doing really good things and we're living up to our standards and whatever. Some days we feel like we're losing because we're not living up to our standards or the standards of the people we care about. Some days we win, some days we lose. But Tim Keller's point is that the secret that a guy like Apostle Paul found out was that you're free from the court. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're actually free from the courtroom. The ultimate verdict is already in about you. So he would say that the, the secret is to know that the trial is over and we're all out of the courtroom in the gospel our performance doesn't lead to a verdict, but our verdict leads to our performance. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's been stated. Listen, at the end of the day, no matter how well you're doing or how poor you're doing, if you have faith in the Lord Jesus, he count, God counts you in Christ. The verdict about your life has already been stated. It's already been rendered. You're not even in the courtroom anymore. You've been freed to go out and live and serve and love, not so that you can gain some standing before people or before God, but because you already have the standing that you require. And when you and I own that fact, that in God's eyes we are perfect and righteous and there is no condemnation, and he says, with you I am well pleased, like he says to his son in whom we dwell. When you realize that those words are being spoken over you, that God sings over you, when you see that, you don't worry about whether or not you're seen really highly in people's eyes or lowly in people's eyes. Whether you're seen highly in your own eyes or lowly in your own eyes. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if you're seen in any way by anyone except for the God who already sees you in Christ. Ah, the freedom of self-forgetfulness. So let me pray. Father, I'm thankful for your grace. I'm thankful ultimately, Lord, uh, that your grace ex gives us a solution to the pride that is killing us. It gives us a solution uh, for the fights we get in. It gives us a solution, Father, for the stupid planning we make. Uh, the presumptu presumptuousness and the comparisons that we that control our life. Father, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves in Christ, that you would help us to understand and feel deeply what it means to be loved by you, to be affirmed by you, that there's no condemnation anymore, and that we're free from the courtroom. So, Father, I pray that you would deliver us in our minds as we've already been delivered in reality. We pray it in Jesus' name. One of the ways that we worship our Lord is by giving back to him out of what we've received from him. We know that everything we have is actually a gift from him. And so if you're new here, we don't want you to feel obligated to give in any way. But if you call Northview your home, uh, we want to encourage you to continue to giving sacrificially, generously, and graciously as you already have been. So thank you. We've got a number of options for you. You could give online at our website, or if you'd like, you could text to give the number that shows up on your screen right now. Or you could send a check by mail or drop it off in person at our Downs Road campus. But now I'm going to turn it back to Frank and the team to lead us in a few more songs. The passion of our Savior The mercy of our God The cross that leaves no question of the measure of his love Our chains are gone Our debt is paid The cross has overthrown the grave For Jesus' blood That sets us free Means death 
Stand before the throne at last His blood will plead my innocence I will worship Him with holy hands And raise a song that never ends Of Jesus Christ, my righteousness My sin is nailed to the cross My soul is healed by the scars The weight of guilt I bear no more Praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord My sin is nailed to the cross My soul is healed by the scars Now I'm alive forevermore Praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord Praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord Well, thanks so much for joining us. We want to send you off with an encouragement from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. Have a great week.